Welcome to the Click Podcast. I'm Danny Watson, a mindset and manifestation expert and founder of The Click, a company that helps women overcome their fears and limiting beliefs to create a life and business that they love. Within this podcast, I will help you get clear on what you want, identify the blocks that are holding you back, transform your mindset and raise your vibration so that you can co-create magic with the universe. If you are looking to design a life that truly sets your soul on fire and manifest more success and abundance, then you are in the right place. Hi, and welcome back to Grounding with Jen. I'm so excited to share this week's guest with you as she's someone that's been an inspiration and a mentor to me along my coaching journey so far. She's the founder of the Click Academy, an ICF accredited coaching course that teaches women about law of attraction, money mindset, and self-love amongst so much more. I would highly recommend it if you're thinking of becoming a coach. She's also the founder of She Leads, which is a course that empowers women to navigate their careers or businesses with confidence and resilience. And on top of all that, she's a published author, a podcast host, and a member of the Forbes Coaches Council. So welcome to the show, Danny. I'm so excited to finally have you join me. I cannot wait to dive into all things manifestation, self-love, money, mindset. How are you doing today? I am absolutely wonderful. And thank you so, so much for having me here on the show. I'm so excited to chat with you and yeah, hopefully deliver some wisdom today for your audience too. (laughs) We have so much to dive into and you have such an interesting story, such an interesting career path, a trajectory that I cannot wait to find out more about today. You have mentioned in the past on your own podcast, the Click Podcast, about starting your career in law and that you never really connected with working in the corporate world. And I know a lot of people listening to this will relate. I definitely can. At what point did you discover personal development and coaching and what inspired you to leave law behind? to pursue coaching as a career? Yes, great question. Well, I think for me, coaching really found me at a point in my life when I needed it the most. Um, I refer to it as my sort of rock bottom stage of my life because it felt like everything around me (laughs) was falling to pieces. And Looking back now, I actually see that that was a real blessing in disguise because it did lead me into the personal development space. So just to give that a bit of context. So I was working in the corporate world and I really had just kind of stepped into that space because it felt like it was what I should be doing. And I never really sort of questioned whether it was actually something that I wanted to do. And now looking back, I can see how I was really influenced by society's version of success, what parents were telling me I should do or teachers were telling me I should do and it never really was truly aligned with what my passions and what my purpose were so I kind of hit this point where I was really really lost because I just didn't know not know what I wanted to do at all so I kind of felt trapped in this job and kind of needing that security of you know making money each month but kind of not really understanding what my options were if I was to leave it so there was that And it really got to a point where it was really giving me huge amounts of anxiety. Um, You know, the Sunday evening blues, the Monday morning dread. Um, So that was kind of all building up on top of me. Then on top of that, I was in a relationship, quite a toxic relationship, where the person that I was with, I knew that he wasn't being faithful. I was actually engaged to this person. So, you know, we were quite serious. And I knew that this was not the relationship for me. And if I'm being quite honest with you, Jam, I was, I think I was just really scared of being alone. So I kind of blocked out a lot of things. I, looking back now, I know that I was really battling with low self-worth. I didn't value myself enough. I did not value myself in that relationship. And I kind of felt to myself, well, if I end this, like, am I just going to be on my own forever? Like, I was really sort of scared of being alone. So I kind of clung to that relationship as a safety blanket, even though it was definitely not serving me. And then on top of that, I was in a huge amount of debt. Um, So I'd accumulated a lot of debt on credit card. I was getting paid relatively well, but I have no idea where all of that money was going because I was just 
spending in this really unconscious, unintentional way where I, I look back now and I don't even know where that money went because spending for me was this way to just kind of numb myself. So I would be shopping online. I would just be going on these like mad shopping sprees when Topshop was a thing. So I was living in London and having these mad, mad shopping sprees without kind of really any kind of conscious awareness of what I was doing. And now with the knowledge that I have, I know that I was emotionally avoiding um, what I was feeling. Um, so I was using it as a way to really kind of numb myself through the pain that I was feeling at the, that time. And so I think like a lot of people, when they really discover the personal development space, it comes at this kind of rock bottom moment where they're kind of looking for answers. And that was really what was happening for me. And the first book that I sort of read, uh, well, I read, was reading a lot of books at the time, but The Power of Now was a book that really sort of stood out to me because I remember just kind of the simple concept of mindfulness, which is really what The Power of Now was all about, and just being in that present moment. And it was the first time in a while that I started to feel really good. So I would be on my morning commute, I would be on a bus, schlepping across London to get to my job that I hated. And I had started to practice these mindfulness techniques. I was like, wow, I feel amazing. And I wasn't really sure what it was, but at the time I know that that was my vibration rising. So I started to really dive into this, into the deeper into this space and experience, you know, law of attraction and start to practice some of the principles that I was learning. And it was this kind of diving into the personal development space that led me into the coaching world. Now, coaching at the time in the UK especially was not really a well-known thing. And I was like, well, what is coaching? And I kind of thought it maybe it was like therapy, but I started to kind of look more just for my own kind of inquiry and for my own personal benefit. And I ended up joining a coaching program, which was really all about helping you figure out your purpose, helping you really with your self-worth and your confidence and self-love. And I was like, wow, this is amazing just for me, but actually this is something that I could really see myself doing. And at the time it didn't really make sense because I didn't really understand, well, how would I make money from this? How would this ever become, you know, a, a career option for me? But there was something there, and I really now believe that when we have that seed of desire planted in our heart, it's up to us to start pursuing it, okay? So I really know that the universe is going to send us these signs and these signals of what we're meant to be doing. So when we feel like we're lost, those subtle seedling of an idea that's planted within our heart, that's normally a good indication of the path that we're meant to be on. So I had no idea about how I was going to make this work, but I just knew that, okay, this is something that I've, I've not felt excited about anything in a long while. And this feels like for me, it's something that I would be good at, even though I don't really know how to coach yet or what's involved with growing a business. There's something telling me that I should pursue this. I should look into this more. And so that's where, where, where it really began for me in terms of deciding, yes, I'd like to become a coach. Now, obviously going from that point to then starting my business, you know, that was another sort of transition and journey in itself. But it was that point really for me, my rock bottom, where it was like, I was kind of given this lifeline of like, okay, this is something that you could do. And yeah, I guess that's where it really all started for me. Thank you so much for sharing that. It's really interesting. And I had a really similar moment with the power of now as well. I used to sit on the bus from Vauxhall to Old Street Love and it. read it. When you said that, I was like, oh. So we actually had a similar journey because I was in Clapham, so not so far. So I was going from sort of Southwest over to the city. So yeah, very similar story. Parallel lives, honestly. Yeah. And I really liked what you said about learning about it and thinking, how can I teach others this and I really do think we teach what we need to learn I'm a big believer in that and it helps us to embody I often teach about things that I am learning at the same time and I think we don't need to be the expert that's something you talk about a lot as well you only need to be one or two steps ahead you don't need to have it all figured out and I think that's an illusion a lot of people have yes 
When you made the transition into being a business owner, how did you maintain a positive mindset and believe in your dreams? As you said, you feel like you had that conditioning around society, your parents. I know a lot of us probably have as well. And those people might have thought you were being irresponsible or thrown away your education or not following the right path. How did you navigate your way through this and create that positive mindset and keep your vibration high? To be honest, I think that was the, the, the most challenging thing because, you know, going from this place of rock bottom, it wasn't like, okay, I'm going to start doing all of this mindset work and all of a sudden I'm feeling amazing. It was this sort of gradual blossoming at the time. So I was, I was excited that I had found coaching, but I knew for me it was going to be a mindset shift because I realized I'd very much been programmed into what I thought I should do. And a lot of my fears were centered around things like, well, what are other people going to say? Nobody's going to get this. I don't think I necessarily doubted my own success so much. I think I've realized that as I've kind of more recently, actually, I used to think, you know, I doubted myself. I had a lot of fears about whether I could be successful. I think looking back now, I think I always knew deep down that I could do this. I was like, I've got the potential to do this. What I think really kind of rocked my confidence was the fact that others doubted me. And I think when I started to tell other people about, okay, this is what I want to do. I'm thinking about becoming a coach. I'm starting this business online. I'm eventually gonna leave my job to take this business full time. So many people were saying to me, who's gonna pay you? <laughs> My parents especially didn't get it. I think it took them a while to kind of grasp what coaching was. So I think that was kind of my biggest challenge, like really trying to stay strong with what I knew was going to be my path when other people really doubted it. For me, what was really key to this was a really solid mindset routine. Now, routine and, and creating these daily rituals that you can weave into your life for me has become a non-negotiable. So my life now is quite different to how it looked at the beginning because, you know, my business is different, but also I'm now a mother. So things like getting up early and doing a morning routine has become a little bit more challenging. However, at the time, I had the ability to be able to get up before work and actually set those real strong intentions for my day before, you know, I then got t taken away to, you know, the job and whatever. So for me, things that have been really key to transforming my mindset has, has been really examining what my belief system is. Something that I learned from the law of attraction, and you'll know this, is that, you know, our beliefs shape our reality. So I realized I had all of these beliefs about what I was capable of and what it would require of me to be successful that were perhaps out of line with what I needed my belief system to be. So for me, reprogramming those subconscious beliefs was a really important part of the process. So there's so many different ways that we can do this, but I think a real wake up call for me was realizing that some of the things that I was using, so things like affirmations, things like journaling, I love these things, don't get me wrong. These are super, super powerful techniques. And they're a great kind of starter place for anybody that's wanting to work on their mindset. But I realized that these were only dealing with the surface level beliefs, so the conscious mind. So we can think about our negative thoughts. So maybe it's like, I don't believe that I can do this, or I believe that making money is hard work. We can look at what we consciously believe, and we can start to work on those beliefs and challenge them. But actually, we're still going to be left with so many beliefs below the surface that we may not even be aware of. So I almost liken our belief system to an iceberg where we have the tip of the iceberg, which is the conscious mind, and everything below the surface is the subconscious. And that's actually the biggest part of the iceberg, the, the part that we don't actually see. And this is the part that we really need to be addressing. So the subconscious mind is that, that programming that's just operating in the background that we're perhaps not even consciously aware of. And within that subconscious mind is going to be a whole set of beliefs that are out of line with the reality that we want to create. And so really, this, this part of the work is twofold. It's first of all, identifying what's actually going on in our subconscious mind, and then it's bringing all of that junk to the surface so that we can start to reprogram some of those beliefs. So for me, a lot of this work involves going into 
what what did I experience during childhood? So a lot of my work was starting to reevaluate or kind of go back into my childhood experiences. So it, when it came to things like success and making money and worthiness, it's like, what was I taught from a really young age to believe? So key things that really came up for me was the way to be successful is through working hard and getting a job. And when it came to making money, it's you've got to work hard to make money. And then when it came to things like my, my worthiness, it was your worthiness is based upon how hard you work. So for me, I was very much rewarded as a child for working hard and being the good girl at school and you know studying during school and during exams and things. So my narrative was like, I get praise if I'm working hard and if I'm being the good girl and if I'm you know, pleasing others, essentially. And so I very much created this narrative that says, like, I'm only going to feel worthy if I'm proving myself through working hard, through being productive, and through doing things that is going to please others. So I realized if I wanted to create my new path in life where, you know, it wasn't about pleasing others, it was about pleasing myself first, I would really need to find a way to detach my worthiness from that productivity piece and from that, you know, that pleasing others piece. So that for me was where the real work began. So yes, I was doing a lot of these, you know, very lovely mindset practices like journaling and affirmations. And I, I love these things, but for me, it was going deeper into the subconscious mind. That's when I found real transformation started to take place. So it was a process of bringing out what I'd learned in childhood, bringing all of those those beliefs to the surface so that I could then start reprogramming some of those beliefs. So yeah, that's kind of, I guess, in a nutshell, <laughs> where my, my mindset work really began. That's fascinating. And I think so many people don't realize that a lot of the work is in the unseen. It's not always in the doing, it's in the being and questioning and being the loving observer, as I always say. And I really connected with what you said about others not believing in you and only believing when they saw the tangible evidence. It's like that quote, first they'll call you crazy, then they'll ask you how you did it. And I know your own story that you are now uh, the founder of an eight figure business or businesses. And you do often share in your podcast, in your content that you once lived in that flat chair with your partner. Your life wasn't always like this. You were from a very quote unquote normal family. And within several years, you had this wild trajectory almost where you transformed your mindset, transformed your reality. You manifested now living in Spain. You've got your beautiful family. You've got your beautiful husband. You've got the dream board life. And for someone who is listening to this and thinking, wow, I would love to have me a piece of that. I would love to manifest my dream life, but they aren't seeing the physical evidence and the people around them are doubting them and questioning them. What tips, what advice, what words of wisdom do you have for them to keep going when they're not seeing the physical evidence? That's a great, great question. I think what I, for me, was really, really powerful was to almost become a product of my imagination. And I think I'm quite lucky in that respect because I've always had a really vivid imagination from being quite young. Like, I remember being sort of four or five and having this, like, whole group of imaginary friends <laughs> that I would chat to. <laughs> so I think I've naturally got that very sort of vivid imagination and I can see things in my mind very, very clearly. So if you're somebody that's quite visual, that is really going to support you. So for me, when I was, say for example, me and my, he was then my boyfriend, we were living in a flat. It was a two bedroom flat that we shared with five people. So we were actually living in the living room. We didn't have a proper bed. We didn't have any like wardrobes or anything. The circumstances were less than ideal, but I knew that to get to where I wanted to be, I had to align my thoughts and my energy with the reality that I wanted to create. So if I was getting up every day and I was focusing on, oh God, like look at my flat, like I hate living here, I hate my job, I have no money in the bank. If I kept thinking about those things, I was just going to keep reinforcing those things into my reality because whatever we focus on is going to expand. So the universe can't distinguish between wanting something and not wanting something. So even though I was saying, I don't want to have this flat, 
the universe just hears like, okay, this flat, this flat. So it's going to keep giving me the same circumstances over and over again. And I think this is what happens with a lot of people is they focus on the things that they don't want to experience. So let's say something isn't working out for them. They keep focusing on the things that aren't working out for them perhaps trying to sort of fix things or solve things, but actually it just keeps them in that same loop. So for me, I needed to break away from my current reality by focusing on something entirely different. So even though I was waking up each morning and I was in this flat and nothing worked and it was a mess and it was old and it needed renovating, in my mind, I was already in my dream home. So as I was walking to, you know, into my kitchen to go make breakfast, I would be imagining myself, okay, if I was in my dream home now, what would that experience be like? How would that make me feel? You know, I would picture in my head, like my dream kitchen, my beautiful coffee station where I'd go and make my morning coffee. I'd imagine my, you know, beautiful sacred space that I could walk into and go and do my morning routine. So even though physically I was sat in my tiny little bedroom, you know, doing my visualization. Mentally, I was somewhere else completely. So that I found really served me. And I think if you are not somebody that's necessarily that, you know, have a very strong visual imagination, start taking yourself in places which cause you to start to get a hint of what that dream life could look like. So rather than just writing it down or visualizing it, actually take yourself to places that help you connect with that dream life. So a good example of this was I started to go and look at properties way before I was able to afford a property. So yes, I've got, you know, my dream house now, but my next sort of upgrade from that initial flat where I started my business was just for me and my boyfriend to have our own flat. So it wasn't, you know, this grand mansion. It was this next level upgrade, which for us was this place that we could just call our own that had, you know, it was our own space. And it also had a spare room, which I could turn into my home office. So that was sort of our next upgrade. And even before financially, we were in a position to be able to afford that next step. I started to go and look at flats, you know, not from a place of, oh, I hope one day this is possible, but getting into that energy of this is already a done deal. Like, why wouldn't I be going and looking at a new flat for my my boyfriend and I, we can afford this. We've completely, you know, got this in our bag. So I had all of these like pictures of the flats that I wanted to manifest. And then I started to just book appointments with estate agents and started to go and look around these gorgeous flats in London, showing up as if this was my new normal. And what we're actually doing here is we're actually telling our subconscious mind, like, this is my new normal. It doesn't feel so alien to the subconscious mind. Because something that's really interesting about the subconscious is that it hates change. It hates being taken outside of its comfort zone. It always wants to bring us back to what is familiar. So if I was saying to myself, I'd love to have my own flat, but that was really unfamiliar to me, my subconscious mind is going to try and reject anything that takes me closer to that. So I needed to start making that new flat as if it was already a part of my existence. So doing things like going and looking at flats and starting to visualize myself in that new flat, I was basically tricking my subconscious mind into saying, this has already happened. This is already my reality. And when it starts to feel familiar with something, it will cause us to act in a way that aligns with that new reality. So it will have a direct influence on our actions, our behaviors, how we show up for life, that causes us to start creating that reality for ourselves. So that was something that I used to do, which I absolutely loved. With things like, for example, you know, my finances. I wasn't a millionaire at this point, but I started to do little things that were going to trick my subconscious mind into thinking that it was. So things like, you know, printing out a bank statement, and rather than it being, you know, in the, the minus of numbers, in the red, I started out to print out bank statements and just change that figure so it reflected the figure that I wanted to see when I looked on my, my online bank account. I would do things like, um, you know, the, the classic thing from The Secret where you write out a blank check to yourself with the amount that you want to see coming into your bank account each month. So these little things, you know, they're fun to do, but on a deeper level, they're tricking your subconscious mind to believe that this has already happened and therefore your reality will start to match whatever your subconscious starts to believe. 
something that really came up when you were talking is that awareness around when you're self-sabotaging and not allowing things to be good enough or feeling like you're not worthy and getting back to that energetic set point of being in the minus or having just enough. And when you did start to manifest more money, how did you learn to feel safe around it and not to, again, spend unconsciously? What shifts took place for you to feel worthy of earning more and living in overflow as well? Yes, great question. It was interesting because money mindset work was something I'd never really heard of. And I was fortunate that I discovered it quite early on in my coaching business because I was reading all of the things, you know, listening to all of the podcasts and you know, I realized, okay, this is something that's going to be quite relevant for me because I had a very negative relationship with money. And I'd always assumed that money was the product of hard work and what we're doing. And of course, taking action is important. I'm never going to discount that. And a lot of what I've been able to achieve today is because I've really showed up for myself in a big way and I've taken big inspired action. But I know for the most part, a lot of my ability to create money in my life has really come back to this inner piece and this my relationship with money. So a big thing for me was the worthiness. And I now know to be true that our net worth, so what we are able to receive financially, has a direct correlation to our self-worth. So for me, when I was at the worst place financially, It was no coincidence that actually my self-worth was also at an all-time low. So for me, it was this unconscious spending habits that I spoke about where it was like I was almost repelling money because in a way, it was it was a partly to, to numb myself and to avoid what I was feeling, but I just didn't feel good enough. So I would really get rid of anything from my life that, you know, was going to serve me because that was that part of me that just didn't feel worthy. I didn't feel worthy of receiving. I didn't feel good enough. I didn't feel like I deserved a good life. And it was just like you said, it was this this pattern of self-sabotage. A big, big thing for me was learning to receive. So receiving money, yes, but just receiving in all areas of our life. So what we are able to receive in terms of our finances is also going to be influenced by how we allow ourselves to receive in other areas of our life as well. So for me, something that was a badge of honor was this hyper-independence. Again, a product from my younger years where I learned to be super-duper independent and feeling like I didn't want to ever have to rely on anybody. So this for me was really traced back to being the eldest of three siblings where my two younger sisters were quite close in age. My mom was often alone with us because my dad would work away for chunks of time. And so as the eldest sibling, I was the one that had to kind of look after everybody, look after my sisters, and also be super, super independent from a young age because my mom was dealing with, you know, two very small children in nappies. So that kind of really stuck with me. And I kind of wanted to keep being super independent because I could see, okay, well, this really, really helps my mom. So For me, this independence, it then kind of led into this real struggle to accept help, accept support. And that inability to receive support was then filtering in my inability to actually receive money. And so it was interesting how these two are very much interlinked. So it might be for for other listeners listening to this, like thinking about where in your life outside of finances do you struggle to receive? So I know that for many of my clients that I've worked with, it's that inability to receive love, unconditional love. It's like they will perhaps find themselves in patterns within relationships where they push people away. Um, You know, they maybe will get really, really close to somebody and then they'll cut it off before it gets too serious. And like you said, it often comes back to this feeling of safety, right? It's like that, okay, well, I don't want to feel rejected. Therefore, I am going to self-sabotage this before I get that opportunity to be rejected. And I found that what was interesting was that kind of came up in my money story as well, this sort of feeling of rejection or feeling of failure. So for me, I was... Mm -hmm. On the one hand, I was saying, look, I'm ready to open myself up financially and to receive more. But I was really worried about what that would mean for me. It's like, okay, well, maybe I do receive, but what happens if I then lose it all? What happens if I then fail? 
you know, what kind of responsibilities might come into my life if I have more money. So yeah, there was so much to unpack for me and my money story. But I think probably the biggest thing was the the connection between working hard and making money. Um, And so this was a narrative that I'd seen through sort of my my parents who'd, you know, my dad had worked really, really hard in order to, to make money. And how I found this playing out within my business was this real kind of addiction to doing the doing. So if I just put in as many hours as I can within my business, then surely it will work. And if I'm being completely honest, for a while, that did actually work quite well. So I actually found that, you know, I can work all of these hours. I can outperform other people by working as many hours as I can, getting up early and staying up late. And, you know, this is going to work for me. And and it did to a certain extent. However, the issue with that is that there's only so many hours we can give, right? So that we are going to be at full capacity very, very soon. So I found that it had been able to get me to a certain point within my business. But when it came to surpassing that income milestone, it was like, well, there's only so much that I can give here. So this for me was where really where money mindset really came into play because I realized that I needed to transform my beliefs about what it would require of me to make more money and really break down that connection between making money and hard work. And for me, it was really recognizing that its majority is our energy and being in alignment. So yes, the work is going to be important, but is only going to account for 10 to 20% of the money that we make. The rest is really about being in alignment. And being in alignment is really about focusing on who you're being and the energy in which you're taking your action rather than just hustling and doing the doing and trying to work as hard as you can. So for me, it was really about feeling safe to actually relax and slow down and trusting that that would actually help me make more rather than that would mean actually making less. So what you said about kind of that feeling safe is a really interesting phrase because when I sort of started doing the work around this, I realized that I'd never felt truly safe to relax. So again, like everything, it kind of came back to childhood. Um, You know, I remember being younger and, you know, we always had to be doing something. We had to be helping out in the house. Like, you know, my mom was on her own a lot, so we were kind of helping her out. We could never just, you know, on a weekend, just sit in front of the TV and relax. It was like, we always had to be doing something. We always had to be productive and we were praised for being productive. And often if we were relaxing, it was like, right, okay, come on, what are you guys doing? And it was this quite explosive parenting, which being a mother now, I get, (laughs) I get kind of the the frustrations perhaps my mom had of having three of us at home. And, you know, sometimes there would be episodes of explosive parenting, but as a child, it's like, our nervous system is put into this fight or flight mode. So we're kind of almost programmed to constantly be on our guard. It's like, okay, well, if I sit down and relax for two minutes, is somebody going to shout at me? And Am I going to be told that I've got to be doing something? Mm. And this has really filtered into my adult life. And me and my sisters have had a lot of conversations around this where we all really, really struggle to switch off and to, to truly relax. So for me, like learning to accept more money, but doing it in this really easy, fun, relaxed way has been the biggest challenge because I've really had to reprogram my nervous system to feel safe to relax, to feel safe to slow down and know that I'm not in any immediate threat or danger if I do things at a slower pace. And also it's not going to hinder my growth if I move at a slower pace as well. So that for me has just been just wildly game changing. (laughs) That's something I'm definitely working on embodying at the moment, because I think coming from a corporate background and even in school, we're conditioned that the harder you work, the better the results, the further ahead you get in life. And that's such a a masculine energy to approach life with. And what you're really talking about is being in the feminine and so much of what I learned through the Click Academy was about embodying the feminine energy, self-love, law of attraction. How did you first discover feminine energy and how else has it impacted your life, not just in terms of your money mindset and being able to receive? Well, for me, it kind of came to that point in my business. So I'd, I'd done a lot of money mindset and my a lot of my beliefs around money, I've managed to change and it, it really supported me in my business. But a lot of the 
way in which I'd been able to make money was still very much reliant on working hard. And I realized I'd fallen back into the same pattern that I really wanted to escape from. So being in the corporate world, I saw people kind of slaving away and giving everything that they could to their career and then really kind of experiencing this burnout. And so many women, especially women particularly, I would say, incredibly talented women were stepping away from jobs that they were really, really good at, but they just could not sustain because of the amount it commanded from them. So I realized if I wanted to take my business to the next level, I needed to figure out a new way of working. And this is what kind of led me into the work of feminine energy, because I realized that I was very stuck in my masculine. And I was not only addicted to working hard, but other masculine traits that I was addicted to. Control, for example. Like, I really struggled to surrender and let go of control. So this was really a big one for me because I knew that for my business to go to the next level, I could not do it alone. And there was a few instances where I tried to bring on support within my business and I really struggled. I ended up creating more work for myself because I was micromanaging and I couldn't just hand over the reins to somebody else because in my mind, I was like, well, are they doing it right? You know, I was meddling (laughs) and I just couldn't just surrender and just accept that somebody else is going to support me here. I don't need to be doing it all. I don't need to be the one that's fixing every single problem. I can kind of let go of the reins a little bit and my business will actually be more successful because of this. For me, I was very much, maybe maybe perhaps a little bit ego-driven in that I was, you know, I wanted to be the one that was doing everything. I liked the, the praise that that came with to kind of say like, look at what I've created all by myself. So I think there was perhaps a little bit of, you know, ego tied in with that. But for me, a big part was that I just never relinquished control before. Like, again, I was hyper-independent. I was used to kind of fending for myself. I'd never got support from anybody. I'd very much kind of paved my own path in life. And yeah, that that control piece was a big one. So for me, it was that feeling safe to let go of control, like safe to hand over the reins and know that I don't have to be micromanaging every single detail of this and I can still get to where I want to be. But there's been so many things throughout my my feminine, I call it my stepping into my feminine leadership era. And I want to actually say something because for me, a big realization was that it's not an either or thing. So for me, it was really about finding my own sweet spot between the feminine and the masculine. So these, if we think of these things as polar opposites. So we've got the feminine, which is all about kind of going with the flow, trusting the process, um, you know, allowing things to be easy, doing things because they're fun, um, you know, collaboration over competition. The masculine is much more action orientated. It's much more structured. It's much more about having that set routine. It's having that strategic plan of where you're going to go. So we've got kind of these polar opposites. And I played around with, you know, being fully in my feminine. When I first discovered this work, I was like, okay, well, this is where I need to be. I need to be in my feminine and create from this space. And if I'm being completely honest, that didn't really work for me. And I found that whilst I knew I needed to surrender and let go more, there was parts of the masculine that I found that actually I'm quite in alignment with. So there's a part of me that really likes structure. I like strategy. I like having a set action plan. The things where I was too much in my masculine in the areas, it was that kind of working too hard and pushing myself too much. So it was about finding that sweet spot. And so something I found that worked really well for me, for example, was to have, let's say, my structured routine, but then carve in my intentional times where I would, I call them intentional, unintentional times. So it's essentially where I would carve in a time within my schedule where I wouldn't have anything planned. And just in that moment, I would say to myself, okay, what do I feel called to create here? What do I feel aligned with? What do, what do I need? What does my body need from me? So it was kind of blending that masculine with the feminine. So for me, again, it's about finding that unique blend, your unique sweet spot between the feminine energy and the masculine and going with what works for you. And some people will be more masculine in nature and that's not a bad thing. You know, we can get a lot done with our masculine, but it's making sure that, you know, it's not stepping into toxic masculinity. So it's, again, it's 
finding that sweet spot of what really, really feels good and what's going to work for you. I'm sure that's going to connect with so many people who are yeah, trying to find that balance between action and surrender and trusting they've done enough. And that's definitely been a big lesson in my own business is like you said, having that intentional time to just be and to be the open channel. Cause if you're always doing, you're never allowing yourself to tap into that guidance to connect with the universe or your guides or whoever you connect with. And I'm curious as you are an eight figure entrepreneur, I can't have you on the show and not ask you what some of your biggest business lessons have been. If you were going to do this all over again, what would you choose to focus on and what would you change or what would you not do? To be honest, I, even though I kind of look back and I was like, "Mm, I wish I did that differently. I probably would change nothing because I don't really see anything as failures. I see them as redirection. I see them as lessons learned. So there's lots of things that I've done within my business that haven't worked. However, because they've not worked, it's given me an idea for something that has worked really, really well. So I think the, probably the only thing that I would have done differently would have been my ability to relinquish control. I wish I'd have kind of done that sooner because, yeah, I I struggled for a long time to just accept the support and bring somebody on board and start to kind of really build out my team. And I think it would have made my life a lot easier if I'd have just built that team out a lot sooner. But no, there's nothing in particular that I would change necessarily. But I think for me, what I feel like I've done very well is taking messy action. And this is, I just think it's been a part of who I am. So it's not necessarily something that I've had to sort of develop. There's there's areas in which that I can get stuck in perfectionism tendencies, but equally, I'm quite good at just doing things and not necessarily having all of the answers and allowing myself to just figure it out as I go. I think a book that probably really helped me here, I read a book called The Lean Startup, which is more of like an entrepreneurial book and more kind of like business practical things. But it talks about a concept called the minimum viable product. And I remember at the very early stages of my business, I had all of these very clear ideas of what I wanted my programs to look like and, you know, my website to look like. And I did find myself overanalyzing everything and probably spending too much time on things that in the grand scheme of things, perhaps weren't that important, or I didn't need to spend that long on them. And so the minimum viable product, which is spoken about in this book, The Lean Startup, it basically says, create something that's perhaps not going to be your perfect product to begin with. It's not going to be your perfect offer. Maybe it's not going to be your perfect program. And take it to market as soon as you can and refine it over time. Now, this isn't to say that we have to put out shoddy work because I'm not an advocate of that either. Like I want to be producing things that I'm really proud of, but I also know that perfectionism tendencies are going to keep you stuck and they're often a fear-based response to, well, what if this doesn't work? What if I get criticized? What if I get judged? What if I fail? So often we use our perfectionism tendencies to just actually stop us from producing anything at all or hold us back from actually putting our work out there. So for me, I've realized that actually, whilst I want things to be good, if I'm trying to make things perfect, it's probably never going to happen because, you know, what is perfect? There's always going to be something that we can change or improve on. So I've got into this great habit, I feel, of taking messy action where I will create something that I'm really proud of, but I don't obsess about whether this is going to be the perfect end product because I know that I will refine things over time. And that's exactly what I've been doing with my my program. So the Click Academy coach training is a really good example of this. Like we are constantly getting feedback from our members and refining things over time. So how the Click Academy looks now is certainly not how it looks when it was first launched. Like it was a really simple program when it first launched. And, you know, it was in the Dropbox folders, for example, Um, you know, not in this like fancy bells and whistles platform that it's on now. Um, We're currently in the process of developing an app for the Click Academy, you know, like these are things that we're adding on. So, you know, we get that feedback from our members and we refine things and we make things better. So it's this 
mentality of constantly evolving yourself over time. So for me, when I look back at things that didn't go well, it's like, oh, well, I don't regret that happening because actually it's allowed us to create what we've been able to create today because we got that feedback. We took the parts that weren't working and developed it and evolved it over time. So yes, long, probably a long-winded answer to your question there. <laughs> No, I'm a big believer in just taking the action. I used to be a ripe perfectionist and everything would have to be perfect before I started. But I think, like you said, the more you just get out there and do the thing, the quicker you learn, the quicker you can pivot. And as Mark Zuckerberg always says, move fast and break things. And that is something I try to live by. Just get out there and try. And at least it'll get you closer to what you do want to do if you realize it's something you don't want to do. And it's something that keeps a lot of people stuck where they are when they think I'll wait till the perfect time. There never is a perfect time. That's just you holding yourself back. No, there's not. And I think you just have to decide. Like I, when I look back at the beginning of my coaching journey, it was less than the perfect time. Like financially, it was a mess, like emotionally, spiritually, physically, I was a mess. You know, I was drinking too much. I was not eating enough. I was exercising too much. And it was the worst time in a lot of ways, but equally it was the right time because I said like, this is it. This is going to be my moment. I'm going to draw a line under the stand. Like tomorrow is my new chapter. And I'm deciding from this moment on that now is the right time for me to do this. And I will just trust that when I start showing up for my dreams, the universe is going to deliver and it's going to support me as well. Mm. You've achieved so much, Danny, including being a wildly successful coach, entrepreneur, a mother of three, a podcast host of the Click Podcast, which I'll link below and I would highly recommend listening to. You are an author as well. And I would love to hear what are you most proud of in your life? Oh, well, I think probably business aside, it's, it's becoming a mother. Obviously I, you know, I think of my business as my first baby and I loved what I've been able to achieve, but actually probably the, the most challenging thing for me has actually been becoming a mother. It's something that I knew from a very, very young age. Like that was kind of the thing that I wanted to do. And I kind of think back to my big why of why I started my business. And it was because I wanted to create a family life where I could be super present and intentional with my children. And, you know, actually in comparison, building a business was a walk in the park. Becoming a mother was probably, it's, you know, it's a wild ride. It's something that I absolutely love being, but I never really anticipated just how difficult and challenging being a mother can be. And so for me, like what I've learned through the process of becoming a mom and everything that comes with that, I think that for me, is something that I'm super proud of. I think the letting go piece, that has been, for me, I think the biggest shift that I've seen within myself because I've gone from somebody that needs to control every outcome and needs to have everything perfectly planned and organized and well mapped out. And I've realized that with children, that that cannot happen. And so I've really had to kind of just surrender more control and go with the flow more, which has allowed me to be in my feminine more, I believe. So yeah, definitely being a mother is by far my biggest achievement. And it's so nice knowing that I've got all of these amazing tools and wisdom that I can now infiltrate with my own kids and, you know, help them to start kind of really living their lives by design rather than by default. They're only super small at the moment, but that's kind of what I want to kind of empower them with as they grow up, you know, when they're choosing their paths to, to be able to know that it's not necessarily about what you do. It's about choosing something that you are truly passionate about and putting, you know, all of your love and att attention and energy into that and knowing that you're always being divinely guided by the universe when you are walking your authentic path. Oh, that is such a lovely way to round off today's episode. I wanted to ask you one last final question and that is what grounds you? What grounds me? Silence. <laughs> Silence, definitely. I know we spoke about routines earlier. Today was actually the first time in a very, very long time that I've actually gotten up before the kids because they wake so early. Um, and actually moving to Spain, it's more of an evening place here. Um, so yeah, this morning I actually got up before the kids and it made me realize I actually need to have silence. So for me, that's meditation. But even just being alone with my own thoughts, that can sometimes be enough. I've realized that I really need to have, even if it's just for five minutes, 
that silence to just center myself, get intentional about what do I want my day to look like? What am I grateful for right now? And, you know, what kind of energy do I want to bring into my day today? Just a little bit of silence and space for just me really grounds me. And yeah, it doesn't have to be a lot. Just a couple of minutes is sometimes all I need to kind of put me in the right energy. So yeah, that's what I would say grounds me. (laughs) It's so simple. It it always comes back to the simplest of things, doesn't it? At the end of the day. Well, thank you so much for joining me today, Danny, and for sharing your insights. I'm sure everyone listening had so many shifts, realizations throughout this episode. How can we keep in touch with you, find out more about the Click Academy, She Leads, your podcast and your book? Well, you can find me on Instagram, Danny underscore Watson underscore coaching, but I've also got a link for you, Gem, for your audience so they can try our introduction to coaching course for anybody that is thinking about pursuing that path with also a discount code as well for your audience should they wish to join the Click Academy in the future. Um, So yeah, I can send those across and perhaps they can be linked into the show notes. That would be fantastic. Thank you so much. I hope you have a lovely day in the sunshine. Thank you so much. Thank you, Gemma. It's been wonderful connecting with you today. Wanting to build your own successful online coaching business, make sure to check out Freedom, Abundance, and Impact, our free 10 day business and mindset course for coaches and aspiring coaches. To access, simply head to wearetheclick.com and click free course in the menu.